Welcome to Studio One at Point Blank. Um, today we have a super, super special guest today, Nick Hulks. Um, he's probably best known to be the founder of XL Recordings and the Positiva labels. He's also an artist manager. He manages The Prodigy, Liam Howlett. Uh, used to manage DJ Fresh, Casper, I think. Yeah, um, yeah so he's going to be talking to us about his life in music for the next hour or so. Um, and if you do have any questions, we've got loads of time at the end for those. So we'll have like a little break afterwards. So save your questions for then. Take it away, Nick. Cool, all right. Well, no, thank you for inviting me here. I'm gonna do a combination sitting down and standing up. I think I'm gonna sit down for the minute and then have a, have a little bit of a stretch. A quick overview of, of what I do at the moment. As, as Carly said, primarily I'm an artist manager currently. The Prodigy, um, Stanton Warriors, Bad Company UK. I also manage some new up and coming guys, uh, uh, an act called Catchment who are on the rise, an act called Wombit who've just had a big record with Noah Cyrus, signed to Ministry of Sound. So it's a sort of quite a broad roster covering various different areas of, of dance and electronic influence music. My kind of journey uh, through to, to the point that I'm, I'm at now started uh, at a very young age and I think that a lot of people who have success in the music industry they don't enter the music industry thinking like oh this is you know I could either be a racing driver or an investment banker or, or a footballer or, or be involved in the music industry and I'm going to pick the music industry because I think it's the one where I'm going to make the most money um, and it has the most stable career prospects. I mean if you, th if you anybody thinks that entering the music in industry they definitely need a um, bit of treatment because um, it's not a stable industry at all. So the people who enter it and have success generally enter because they fucking love music basically and it it becomes part of your life and it becomes so much a part of your life that you start to think it's hard for me to imagine doing anything else and then you're so deeply into it and you're rolling forward and things happen and that's probably what's happened to a lot of you where it's almost like it chooses you isn't it rather than you choose it you just find yourself dragged in this zone where you just like find yourself engaged and excited and doing really interesting and positive stuff. So for me, the start point of that was probably as a kid, maybe like about, you know, 12 years old, hearing various sort of records and started to go, ah, you know, actually this music thing is pretty interesting as well. Um, and I uh, kind of, me and my best mate, a guy called Andy Smith, who has uh, mixed the document albums, very respected guy, uh, kind of, um, did a lot of the sample digging uh, on the early Porter's Head records. I grew up in Porter's Head in the West Country, just outside Bristol. I uh, went to the same school as Jeff Barrow, who is the, the founder of the, the, the group Porter's Head. And uh, myself and Andy, yeah, kind of really got into underground dance music on Radio 1. There's a show that a guy called Al Matthews did on Radio 1. It's called Disco Vating, and it was on a Saturday night. Um, and I remember we just, we were sort of in, An in Andy's house, and we just sort of, chanced upon it and he was playing a sort of you know an un some underground New York dance music of the time which would have been really unusual music for a 12 year old white kid in the West Country to encounter We're like what is this stuff and then we kind of developed a love of, of dance music through that so we started seeking it out going into specialist record stores uh, there wasn't much it's pre-internet era of course um, there, there, there wasn't much print that you could absorb in that era talking about um, the um, dance and electronic kind of world. So really the main entry point was a, a page in, in Record Mirror that a guy called James Hamilton wrote. So started buying that every week, kind of started absorbing, reading about the new records. Um, and then we thought, yeah, you know what, we've got to have a little mobile disco together. Wouldn't it be fun to run a mobile disco? And there's more nods of recognition. So you can, you know, I can see that some of you have gone along a similar route. Of course, when you're 12 years old, you haven't got pairs of turntables and all the rest of it. So it was a, a kind of stack hi-fi like that from his house. And then flat hi-fi from my house, two speakers with that one, two speakers with that, not linked, 
and we'd t take those two home hi-fis to somebody's house and do, you know, like their 10th birthday party or what have you. But of course you couldn't mix, because there was no mixer. So we'd like have a deck each and I'd fade, what, start it now, no, not now, no, no, now start. You know, and I'd be fading one down, he'd be fading something up. And you know, we'd be playing cassettes that we'd taped off the top 40. So of course it was a bit like, I think it's gonna stop soon. Is it, when's it gonna stop? I don't know. Fuck it, put another record on. You know, this kind of sort, sort of make it up as you go along kind of stuff. And we really enjoyed it because you could, you know, somebody would pay you 10 quid to go and play for a kid's party for a couple of hours. Like, oh, great, you know, some money. This is good because we'd, we'd be doing this, you know, we enjoy doing this anyway. <clears throat> and then I kind of started to expand that a bit. So I sort of um, started to help out at a hospital radio in Bristol. And at some point, I blagged myself a show. I think I was reading the news out, and I was like, oh, I wouldn't mind a show, wouldn't mind a show. They're like, oh yeah, go on, well you can do, you can cover on Thursday, or whatever it was. So I go in, and I'm like, yeah, this is my big chance. So then I'm pulling out my disco, my boogie, my early rap records, you know, that I've got, and sort of playing some pretty banging stuff, thinking this is great. And then I think the station manager was like, uh, <laughs> I don't think, you know, back to Val Dunican, please, you know, sort of, this isn't quite the appropriate moment to sort of, uh, to, uh, to, to play what, exactly what you're playing on the radio. So I got unceremoniously yanked um, off Bristol Hospital Radio, but not before I'd uh, managed to get a few free records in, actually, because if you contact, contacted record company, promotions company say, hey, I've got a show on Bristol Hospital Radio. Um, I do, you know, I do gig reviews, I play music, what have you. I, I found that some promotion departments would send you some records or they might even send you a couple of tickets to go to a gig. Uh, then came the decision point for me when I was um, 18, uh, kind of where I wanted to be, you know, where I wanted to go to uni. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, in the knowledge that all of the main uh, sort of media outlets, record labels, radio stations, etc., are all based in London, I'm like, I need to move to London, you know. You don't have to live in a major urban metropolis to be successful in the music industry, but it does provide a lot of opportunities. So you guys are already ahead of the curve because you're not in a village in Norfolk, you know, you, although there's some good stuff comes out of Norfolk and Ed Sheeran came out of Suffolk, so it's not, not that. So I, I chose to move to London and I really embraced living in um, London. And, and there are lots of opportunities here and, and, you know, kind of a bit of a theme for my life, I think, is sort of maybe sort of seeing, oh, that might be a kind of interesting thing to do. And then I sort of put myself in that situation and then that sort of leads to something else and then that leads to something else. It's kind of a lot of that has happened to me. So, for example, you know, I noticed that there was a Radio 1 DJ who was recording a TV uh, show. Uh, in London, it was like a chart show that went out on a, one of the music cable TV uh, stations. So I thought, oh, that might be interesting to go to. So I go to the recording of this show, um, and then after it, you know, he's just chatting to a few, a few people, and I go, oh, I'm just going to wing it a bit. I'm going to go up to this guy and just strike up a bit of conversation. So I go up to, oh, you know, enjoyed that, thanks a lot, oh, yeah, fine, whatever. And I go, this might be an odd question, but you, do you ever need anybody to like help out on your show on Radio 1? Just doing anything, helping out? I don't, I don't know. But he goes, well, not exactly, but we, you know, we have like a little part of the programme, which is like a record review section. And we do get, you know, students and young, young people coming in and reviewing records. So I'll tell you what, here's the phone number of my producer. Give him a call. I don't know whether there's anything there, but give him a buzz and see what happens. So, oh, thanks, Matt, thanks. This is Peter Powell, this, this DJ. Um, and then, so the next day, I call up his producer, and he goes, yeah, okay, we'll come in on, you know, next Tuesday and, uh, and have a chat or whatever, so did that. And then, um, yeah, I became part of what was called the pop panel. So it was um, like three Radio 1 listeners, every week in rotation, you know, probably from a pool of, let's say, seven listeners or eight or nine, whatever. And, they, you know, they'd play the new records and we were supposedly the sort of kids off the street giving our opinion, oh, I think it's good, I think it's bad, whatever. 
Um, <clears throat> and I started doing that regularly, so I was kind of on Radio 1 reviewing records as a uni student um, in my, I can't remember what year of uni that was, uh, but I was, I was doing that and uh, that was sort of interesting and what I learned from that is we weren't kids off the street though, you know, like I was somebody who was like keen to move into maybe radio records and then one of the other people worked for a, a live you know agency as an intern and wanted to be a music agent and somebody else wanted to be a music journalist and you know these are all sort of people who were trying to find their way in the industry who'd sort of made these approaches to get into that sort of position but it came about by just initiating that conversation and then that opportunity evolved so that was interesting, I was doing that. And then I also took up the, the opportunity while I was at uni to do some travelling. Obviously you've got big chunks of summer holidays available. Um, <clears throat> so I um, applied for a visa called the Work America visa. And I think it's still in operational. I think if you're like under 26 or something, you can get like a short term um, opportunity to, to work in America, you know, for six months or summer type thing. And most people who get the Work America visa, they go and work on kids' camps. You know, it's in the summer and you're teaching baseball or craft or whatever. Didn't really appeal to me. Um, so one of the things you could do was you could just get, like, find a job. I mean, I rocked up into New York and the first thing I did, I was like, well, let's try and find some kind of job that pays, gets a few quid in. So I got a job as a cinema usher in Queens. So in the, every evening, bow tie, white gloves, ticket please. Sorry about that popcorn spill, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but the good thing about that was that I had my days free. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll see, you know, if I can kind of get some, um, get something interesting happening in, in the daytimes. And I thought, I wonder how I can get involved at a radio station or a record label. Because I'd already kind of figured that if I just write in, oh, have you got any internships available? I probably wouldn't hear anything back. And I did send a bunch of those letters before I went and I didn't hear anything back. Um, so I came up with a bit of a ruse and I thought, mm, I know what I'll do. I said, I'm going to phone up a couple of radio stations and I'll say, oh, I'm, I'm writing an article on New York radio and maybe I can interview somebody from the station and that might be a way that I can kind of just get to meet somebody from a radio station. Fuck it, give it a go, what have I got to lose? So pick up the phone, find the phone number for WBLS, phone up, say, oh, can I speak to the head of the station, please? And, okay, and put me through to the, you know, who is it? I'm like, oh, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I'm writing an article on New York Radio. Put me through to the assistant for the, of the head of WBLS. Then I explain, I say, yeah, hi, I'm writing an article on New York Radio, I'm just in New York at the moment, I'm wondering if I could interview uh, Mr Kirkland. Okay, and you know, took some note. Okay, and what uh, publication is this going to appear in? I'm like, it, probably London Student, possibly Time Out. Not sure yet. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, she's like, okay, fine. Um, and so we put the phone down. Ten minutes later, phone goes. Oh, hello. It's like, yep, yeah, no, Mr. Kirkland would be happy to do the interview. Do you want to come in tomorrow morning? Great. Put the phone down. God, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> didn't have any. Didn't have any questions. You know, I'm frantically. Flipping through the, the dial, trying to listen to other radio. Oh, God, come up with some questions here, you know, type thing. I go in, do the interview with him, and um, he then um, introduces me after we've done the interview to the lady that ran the programming area. So the programming department <coughs> is the, you know, they figure out the, the, the playlist stuff and, you know, charts and things like that. File all the records and CDs away, whatever. Um, and so I get introduced there and then uh, I said to the lady who ran that, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm in New York, I'm working in the cinema Russia. I mean, if you want me to help doing anything here, I'm kind of in the stage. Yeah, okay, well, you know, all these records need filing and, you know, and funnily enough, we, we compile a chart every day. So, you, you know, actually, can you call, can you phone these 15 record stores and you get the top five from them and you add up the points and it's like the hottest records in New York. WBLS and KISS were the two main kind of urban stations. Um, and uh, so I did that and got to the end of the day and at the end of the day I was like, oh, thank you so much for letting me, you know, help out. I really appreciate it. You know, it's very, not very kind of you. Thank you very much. She was like, yeah, no, that's, that's okay. So uh, same time tomorrow morning then? And I said... 
uh, 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 well, I can do. Uh, uh, you should like. Would you, she'd like. Yeah, you're you're our new intern if you want to be. I was like, really? She said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, um, great then. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow morning. So that was how I became an intern at WBLS. Pivotal moment comes up about two weeks after I've been helping out. At, two weeks into my time helping out at WBLS. So the radio plugger from Epic Records walks in. Um, and he goes, uh, hey guys, so uh, I got a good one for you type thing, and I'm sort of sitting at my desk, and he goes, uh, new Michael Jackson album, um, world premiere, playback party, who wants to go? There's like three or four of us in the programming office, you know, like, and the, the, you know, um, like Bobby Condors was there, and Francine, and they're, they're like, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, hmm, this is interesting, and I sort of go, like this, I'm like, sort of, you know, kind of like as if I'll raise my hand. I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to, but I'll <laughs> sort of just do it anyway. And he goes, yeah, you're a good kid. You can come. Hands me, the, hands me an invite. So I'm like, OK, this is getting interesting. Um, so then I find myself, I'm a uni student, remember. I'm between my second and third year of uni. And I find myself on this big yacht, like a big Roman Abramovich sort of mega yacht that goes round Manhattan. Um, and it's sort of, you know, free champagne, caviar. I mean, I the only time I'd had free alcohol in a sort of social setting at that, up till that point, would have been a wedding or a funeral or something, you know. <laughs> I'm not used to record label parties, you know. Um, so they're handing out the champagne and I'm like, yeah, what's that? Oh, it's caviar. Is it? Oh, okay. Never had caviar. Who's had caviar at 18 years old? You have a bit of caviar, fine. Didn't like it much, but anyway. Um, uh, and, uh, and I said to my WBLS kind of colleagues, I'm like, so who are, uh, who are all these other people on the boat? And they're like, oh, that's a guy who runs Tower Records. That person is the editor of Billboard. That's the program director at KISS, you know, type thing. I'm like, right. Fucking me, uh, you know. I was like, I've really lucked out here, haven't I? Um, I was thinking to myself, and it was a pivotal moment because I, I did literally in that moment stand there thinking, I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve to be here. I'm not really like the sort of person that they need here. But somehow I am here, and and in my mind I sort of like, well, I can trace it back. I I. I'm here because I was in BLS and the guy came in with the tickets and I sort of put my hand up, but how come I was in BLS? Oh, because I sort of helped out for the afternoon when I did the interview and then I was in BLS because I'd blagged that interview and how did I blag that interview? Oh, because I decided that I wanted to, I was going to work in New York and it all sort of added together and lo and behold, da -da, that's why I was on listening to the Michael Jackson album, you know, amongst the first people in the world to hear a new Michael Jackson record. Um, so, I c you know, it was, it was like I could add up in my brain the steps that it had taken to get to that point. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, this is sort of a bit interesting. I shouldn't be here, but I am. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe then... <laughs> It seems a bit far-fetched to think that I might be able to get a job in a record label or sign a record that's a hit or an act that's a hit or have a hit or something like that or have a hit myself. All seems a bit far-fetched, but this is far-fetched. <laughs> Where I am right now is far-fetched, so maybe that could be possible, that stuff. So at that early point, I was like, yeah, so let's keep sort of kind of putting myself into situations where th interesting things could happen. Not tonight, you're not on the list. Not tonight, you're not on the list.